Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Everyone enjoying WTM? Well, I'm excited. Did anyone read that APTA article uh, that w with me in it about how I first came to WTM in 1993 uh, when I first started G Adventure? So everything started for me here. And it took me 28 years to make it on the big stage. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, so great to be here. Thank you, thank you. Um, we're going to talk, I've got a lot of stuff to review with you guys today. I was just reading what they actually wanted me to talk about. The description is kind of weird. That's not what I was planning to talk about, but I'll change it. Um, talking about passion, purpose, and happiness in travel or in your job. So, and we actually did this, recently did a purpose survey where we sur surveyed uh, travel agents around the world, and I have some of those results for you as well. Uh, but today we're going to start, um, you know, understand about passion, purpose, and happiness. And I just did a series of interviews here with a lot of your, um, a lot of the um, e uh, industry papers here this morning, and they're all asking how do we find more passion, purpose, and happiness, and they want to know what the answer is. There's no magic bullet, of course. Um, but you know, one thing that I always say to everyone is, you know, we all started in the travel industry because we were uh, passionate about travel. I don't think there's anyone, has anyone ever met anyone that decided to get into the travel industry to get rich? Uh, that doesn't happen, does it? Um, so most people go into the travel industry because they love to travel. And it's almost like a teacher job, if you will, because you want to show other people how to travel. You want to show other people why travel is so fantastic. You're excited about other places in the world, so you want to show other people you, know, you have a desire to show other people that. And that's our original purpose and the passion that we have for travel. But unfortunately, that changes when you actually enter the industry because that passion turns into really just you know, selling discounts and knowing about a thousand different operators and being a, and I know this audience is very mixed. I know most of you are industry people. This, I guess it's an industry day today, is it? Is it an industry day today or is there any like real, is there travelers here or just industry people? So can we talk about travelers? How much we hate them? No, I'm just kidding. No, that's, but it's mainly just industry people. So, you know, you have to go back to understand the travel industry. And, you know, you think about going back to 1990. So I'm taking you a bit back to understand how the, where the travel industry came from and to understand where we kind of went wrong in travel today, to understand how we find more passion, purpose, and happiness, because what did happen? So if you go back to 1990, how many people weren't born yet? Anyone? I spoke at uh, Queen's University in Canada a couple months ago, and nobody was born yet when I said 1990. It was quite sad. Um, so go back into 1990. A tourist looked something like this. And there was a race in our industry to build bigger and bigger cruise ships, right? If, you, if anyone can remember that time, there was this, they convinced that more, um, a bigger ship meant a better experience. And they used to advertise, and people would wait and say, like, if there's 1,500 passenger ships, but there's a 2,000 passenger ship, and it's going to have more amenities, so I'm going to wait. And then someone announced they're going to have a 2,500 passenger ship, then a 3,000 passenger ship, then a 3,500 passenger ship. And what they were doing is they were convincing everybody that bigger is better, right? And that more amenities meant it was going to be a better experience for you, because if you're on a ship, this one will have more restaurants, and this, you know, this one will have indoor surfing, or it'll have zip lines, or a Broadway play, all these different things, and this is you know, where we started going off the rails in the industry, because today, you know, the destination becomes irrelevant. You know, people are booking things based on amenities and what they, what they get, and why it'll be better if you, you can eat Japanese food one day, French the next day, and you can have you know, a steakhouse the next day, all within the same trip. And if any of you are on social media with your friends who take a cruise, on, um, um, you'll probably notice that rarely do they actually post a picture of the destination, right? They usually post pictures of their food for some reason. Everyone has that friend who posts pictures of their food. And if you don't have a friend like that, you're probably that friend. <laughs> so don't p post pictures of your food. Uh, but anyways, they, also, they post pictures of the fact that they can surf indoors or do whatever you can do, that they, you know, carousels on board. But the destination becomes completely irrelevant in travel. And if you look at brochures, uh, when brochures start, you know, in the first 10 pages is about how many swimming pools there are, pictures of the room, all the different amenities, and as if, and saying that you need all the creature comforts. If you have all the comforts of home, you know, then you will feel, you will never have to leave your comfort zone. And I think that's the complete opposite of what travel should be. Um, and we always say that if you want the comforts of home, maybe you should think about staying home. 
Like maybe travel isn't, should be, shouldn't be on the top of the things you should be doing right now if you can't leave without feeling like you left home. Um, and you know, and so, you know, so that's way back in 1990 where we were convincing people that bigger is better. We were suddenly building compound walls to put into resorts to create the all-inclusive experience, which is interesting as well, um, how people want to be inside of walls of a compound and they will eat as much and eat and drink as much as possible uh, for a week um, and pay one price. Um, and unfortunately, that's not a sustainable model when outside of that wall, people don't have access to clean drinking water or don't have access to medical care. So these are the tipping points that are eventually going to happen in, in, as people start to live more sustainable in their lives. They can't suspend their beliefs when they go on vacation. There will be a tipping point because we're living more sustainably than we ever have at home. Um, we're, you know, recycling. It's so easy for us to recycle. We just drive, drag our trash to the curb and we turn around, it's gone. It's recycled. Um, we put low light bulbs in our house. We're, doing, we're eating organically. We have 100-mile diets. We're doing all kinds of things to live more responsibly and sustainable at home. Um, but we suspend our beliefs because we're going to another country um, because we're motivated by price point or dates that work or uh, a, day, a deal or a sale or whatever. And this is where the travel industry is gone. And you, you being in the travel industry, you had that passion and burning desire to show people travel. And then you end up with a, this push for capacity. There's a push for capacity. You guys read it all the time in the publications. of How many more ships are coming out in the next 10 years? How many more planes are being um, made for all these airlines? And every airline has a discount airline. And now discount airlines have a discount airline. Um, and, there's, and then more and more compound resorts, all-inclusive resorts, um, and then companies say they're only going to sell all-inclusives now. And so, the, and, and so we're so far away from what the experience of what travel was supposed to be, which is going to our, our, our internal need to explore and see the world. Like we are all born to have a curiosity to want to see other cultures because it helps us feel, uh, gives us a better understanding of where we come from. It gives us a better understanding and a greater appreciation of who we are when we understand how other people live in other parts of the world. We have a natural curiosity. As a matter of fact, standing here in England, of all places, you guys had the most curiosity of all. You guys colonized the world. Um, to actually, the first explorers were the first adventure travelers, where they actually risked their lives to actually discover uh, whether the world was flat or whether there was another country out there or go to the North Pole or the South Pole. All of these things were, you know, were, are, was our, our, our burning desire to explore and travel. And we are born, and I always say we're born to explore, we're born to be travelers, but society makes us tourists. And so when we look at the destination becoming irrelevant, uh, and we look what, what people are booking for a travel experience or trying to get away from their home, we ask ourselves, why did we get in this industry? And we, you know, how do we find more passion, purpose, and happiness? And the first thing is, we have to remember why we got into the travel industry why we were so passionate about travel. And it was because of destinations. It was because of new cultures, different food, music, different ways to explore, and finding different ways to do that. Um, you know, one of some of the scary t t statistics today, uh, this one is one in, uh, 10 years ago. Was that me? Did I just have a seizure? That's weird. OK. So one in five people took an all-inclusive holiday 10 years ago, and today that number is 75%. So more and more people are, are, um, are taking compound holidays and not leaving the resort walls. And they're building this, this, this dialogue that if you leave the walls, then you know, don't leave, it's dangerous because the natives are restless on the other side. So stay in these walls and you have everything that you have to eat and drink in these walls and you pay one price. So that's a concept of all-inclusive. But this is not a sustainable model and there will be a tipping point where people will find this is weird because um, you know, people will eventually want to match their values on how they're living at home with how they're going to travel. Um, and so one of the scariest statistics came out by the United Nations Environment Program is that um, every, of every $100 spent on, on travel, only $5 stays in the local economy. So this is tragic. Um, and this is not sustainable, and it's the biggest opportunity we're missing in the travel industry. So the travel industry is missing the greatest opportunity to transform lives around the world by creating compound resorts and cruise ships, taking people on and off, when local people aren't benefiting, um, and especially with the way the world is, is changing. So business models have to change, and we talk about this all the time, but you know, 
the travel industry is growing, and there's very few industries in the world that are going to grow as fast as the travel industry. So the good news is, if you're a student or you're new to the travel industry, you picked a great industry to be in. Because we had one billion tourists in 2013. We were about three years early from hitting that billion tourist mark. Um, and that's going to double uh, in the next 10 years. And not many industries can tell you that they're going to double within the next decade. Um, and it, also, in, um, in 10 years, we will grow to a 10% GDP of the world the, the global GDP, or 10% of the world's global GDP. So it's a massive, massive industry that has a huge impact on the world. But if money isn't staying in the local economy and benefiting local people, it's the biggest opportunity that we're missing as an industry. Um, and so the conundrum that we face is that of the 100 poorest countries in the world, or sorry, 40 poorest countries in the world, tourism is the first or second most important source of foreign exchange after oil. And with the price of oil right now, tourism is the most um, an important form of revenue to some of the most 40, 40 poorest countries in the world. So what's happening here is, you know, people are traveling to the countries that are most in need. Um, some of the, the, the citizens of the, the planet are the most disadvantaged um, and are living uh, in extreme poverty. They're going there on luxury vacations. They're paying thousands of dollars to go to those vacations. And according to UNEP, that money's not staying in the, in the local economy. So this is an issue that we all face and the opportunity that we, um, we, we're missing in the travel industry, for travel to be a force for good. The travel going to these 40 poorest countries, we could transform lives as an industry. And imagine if travel um, you know, was our form of giving back. You know, I've always said that travel can be the greatest form of wealth distribution that the world has ever seen. And, as a, and as, you know, we're all taught to be charitable and to give to charity. We, we're, we grow up to be charitable and we see a commercial, and maybe human rights is our issue, so we donate to Amnesty International. It's been well curated for you. If there's an issue that you have, there's a charity for you to give to. If it's disaster relief, there's the Red Cross. If there's poverty alleviation, it might be UNICEF. Animals is World Wildlife Fund. There's, a, there's the right one to give to every single way to match your values. But imagine if we got to a place where going on holidays could be your form of giving back. The idea that you're traveling to some of the, mo the poorest countries by creating jobs and creating local experience for, um, for yourself or, or if you're in the industry, for customers, and that money went back in the economy. Travel could be this, uh, in, with $10 trillion, could be the greatest form of wealth distribution that the world has ever seen. And that's always been the dream of G Adventures, for us to you know, be part of that change and be a company that represents something much greater than travel, that transcends the industry, and travel transcends just being a travel company. In order to do that, um, business models have to change. And business models are changing as the speed of light. Because business works in parallel with society. And so what's happening in society today is more and more people we have, uh, is, is the digital age. That's what's changing. Technology and digital is changing the way we do everything. How we consume travel, how we book travel, how we research travel. Everything is in our pockets now. And it's at the speed of light. And so. Um, business um, has to change and that's in the same way. So for years, social entrepreneurship has existed for um, decades, which is nonprofits that act like uh, for-profit companies, and they call that social entrepreneurship or social, um, um, social innovation. So World Wildlife Fund se sells you a tiger. They sell, sell you a fuzzy tiger. They're acting like a business because they're selling you a product, but then they're going to take that money and they're going to save the tiger. That is a, what social entrepreneurship for nonprofits are. But there's been a change in transparency with businesses uh, because of social media. And it's changed the way people do business because of the speed in which people can communicate and gather information. So we were all raised, for those of you who were born before 1990, we were all raised with one-way communication and marketing. Um, best example is Nike. Nike built a global empire by, by, by just communicating one-way messages to you about you know, Michael Jordan in the 90s. They, he, they hired the greatest athlete. You guys remember those super inspirational, amazing commercials of Michael Jordan dunking the ball. Like all marketing, you, you walked into the store, you saw the Nike jacket, you thought it made you feel good, so you buy that Nike jacket. That how, that's how marketing was created from the beginning of time a one-way conversation to you to make you feel good about something and then it makes you trigger to purchase. Well, social media has changed that because uh, you have to now have a two-way conversation to engage your customers. And to become an iconic brand, you have to be much more. You have to tell a story. Um, and there's no greater example than that than Nike because they had a dominant space until a more social 
company, Under Armour came in, who has a really dynamic CEO who's out there doing crazy things and traveling and very adventurous, putting it all viral, and suddenly their dominance you know, had its first true competitor. So to be an iconic brand now, if you want to be uh, Nike, you can follow Phil Knight on Twitter. All their factories, like all that stuff in the 90s where we found out about those sweatshops, that couldn't exist today. All their factories have Facebook pages. If they fire employees, they all go and write stories on Glassdoor or whatever. All that stuff is now creating a two-way conversation in order to be an iconic brand. And in the future, people will not buy products from brands. They'll buy things from other people. Um, and so your people and your brand become connected. Does that make sense? Trying to make it as clear as I can as I move, before I move on. But these two things have come together to create a whole new breed of company, which we call social enterprise. And social enterprise is, um, can be any company, and because when you think about it today, that when, you, you know, when we grew up, we, we gave money to pay people like UNICEF or the Red Cross to save lives and change the world. But when you look at it today, the people that are really changing the world and have the biggest impact are entrepreneurs and people who own businesses, uh, like, uh, like uh, Bill Gates or Warren Buffett or Mark Zuckerberg or you know, um, um, Jeff Bezos, um, these guys who are going to actually intertwine social enterprise within their business. And today you see all kinds of businesses doing it. I saw a profile, and I tell this story all the time. Have you ever had this experience where you've never heard of a company before? And then when you hear about it, you suddenly hear about it every day, and you realize, how did you ever miss this before? So I had that experience with a company that's actually British called Burberry. So Burberry I'd never heard before. And so one day I came across this whole new launch of them being a social enterprise. And to me, the video looked like this was a company that sells, well, plaid clothes or something. Um, but they were professing they were going to be this new social enterprise. And it's great, and it was interesting, because it led me to, um, it gave examples of other companies that were doing all kinds of other work in all kinds of other fields. And it, didn't, it wasn't just reserved for travel. It was open to everybody. And how social enterprise and that two-way conversation of creating a much more intimate relationship with your customers was suddenly becoming so important to being um, an iconic brand in today's world. So for us, it's about changing people's lives. And travel has always been about changing people's lives. And when you talk about finding more passion, purpose, and happiness within our industry, um, you know, it's a very, we are one of the most passionate industries of people. Um, and for us, it's always been about anyone touching our brand having the opportunity to change their lives, whether it's our employees, our customers, or our suppliers. Um, G Adventures has always been about creating that environment. Um, but we often say your culture is your brand, and I said this a couple times already. When you decide that you want to, you know, you know what makes happiness, um, you know, create happiness, and I'm going to go over that in a minute, is about connectedness and people being passionate about what they do and connecting. When you put your culture, your company culture, uh, at the forefront of your brand, and um, you know, you're, it's, it's, it's answering what I said earlier about people buying products from other people and not brands. People want to relate to the people that they buy from, and they want to know the people they buy from. So it's so critical that the people that you have representing your company, your people become an important part of the delivery of your brand promise. Um, there is no greater example for that in the travel industry because we're exporting services. It's one of the weirdest things, actually, when you think about it, that you know, someone is going to book an African safari in Germany with a Canadian company. Um, they do that because you create a brand promise that people relate to, and they relate to your people over just a Nike swoosh or just an icon or a logo. It's about um, believing in what you do. And there is, and as I said, there is a tipping point where people will decide they want to match their values, the way they live at home, with their holiday time. I'm banking on it. So we did this um, study about your, you know, your culture being your brand. So we, you know, they, they mentioned in the, uh, the article there um, about our, um, so we, what we're trying to do is we're trying to match the, the purpose of our customers with our purpose as a business. So we've linked our customers, um, like our travelers, and our company as you know, purpose-driven in everything that we do. And I could talk about that for hours, but I won't get into that. But what we're trying to link is our biggest customer, which is travel agents. So we did a travel agent survey to bring, to bring travel agents into our story of how we view that travel can be a movement, and travel can truly transform lives and change the world, um, and, and, and prove that. So we wanted to find out um, within the industry you know, where that passion was for travel within travel agents. So if you, you know, your culture being your brand, um, 
we asked 36, so we polled 3,600 travel agents around the world. And travel industry people are more likely to be promoters of your brand than other companies. So we used the polling of 3,600 travel agents, as well as some data that we had with, uh, with uh, using LinkedIn going across all industries to get some of this information. But they're 35% more likely uh, to promote the company they work for within the travel industry than any other industry. So people love what they do and they love the company they work for, and they're 35% more likely to talk about it. And there's no greater um, you know, PR or press or um, the way to promote your business than having ambassadors within your business. And getting happy people to talk about the place they work at is one of the greatest ways in which you can create a conversation with your customers. Um, and so our industry is in a great place when 35% of the people are more likely to talk about just the place they work. And that's across all industries. And the other thing that we found is about purpose driven. And this is a very interesting, and I've actually brought up some other facts that weren't here. But um, so of, the, uh, of, 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 of people that we identified, the 3,600 travel agents, we asked them to identify it as a profile. And out of the, those um, 3,600 agents, 71% um, of them um, identified themselves as being purpose-driven purpose or purpose identifying with a purpose-driven mission in their business or their work, meaning that they believed that what they were doing, the travel was, you know, they wanted to change the world through travel. Um, so this is, a, and if you look across all other industries, um, which we did, um, that's only 64%. So people are, in our industry are more passionate about, you know, about, you know, purpose-driven work. Um, they they want to change the world. They want to be part of something great. Um, and then they also are more likely to talk about it. And so they're also likely to talk about where they work. These are amazing ingredients for small businesses or large businesses to use these things as a, uh, as a way to promote your uh, business in a social world. Uh, and then there's adventure agents. These are agents or, or people within the adventure-specific industry, and that number even grows higher. Um, to 80% of the people who identify themselves. So, um, so the, the, I mean, this, the, these are just kind of stats that I wanted to highlight. I just wanted to actually highlight two, a couple of the things that we um, noted in the, our survey that I didn't put slides for. 91% of the people within a per, uh, that identified themselves as um, um, purpose-orientated um, said that they were satisfied with their job, that they loved their job. This is incredibly important in an industry like travel that has uh, massive turnover. Because this, this will help me, because as we go out to train travel agents, and there's so many agents that have 30 and 40% churn of their employees every year, and they can't keep up with the training needed because of the turnover. But people who feel that they're part of something, uh, or purpose-driven, um, are 91% are satisfied with the job and with the people um, they work with. Um, and the, and the, that's the global average, but in the UK, it was 98% in the UK. So that's a, that's a phenomenal number. Um, and out of, that per, out of that group as well, 34% said that they would st will stay at their job for 10 years or more. So when you're trying to build a great company or build, build a great business, you need to be able to hire and retain the best people. And uh, I need you to hire and retain the best people because travel agents are our number one customer. So I want to do everything possible to help you hire, like um, find and attract the best people and keep them and keep them longer so we don't have to train them every year. So there's reasons for you know creating these kind of um, um, creating, doing this talk today uh, to travel agents specifically. So my I wrote a book there. Uh, it's I think um, we're giving it out there, right? It's, it's free. It's a great deal. How? Everyone's, how can we give it out free? Who's paying for those? Anyway, um, the thing that was extraordinary about this book is the Dalai Lama wrote the forward. So the Dalai Lama wrote the forward in my book, and I don't have a sexy story about why or how I got the Dalai Lama to write the forward. He ne he's never endorsed a business book, or he's never write a forward for a business book. So people thought it was a big deal. Um, I, and the only story I have is that I asked, and he said yes. Um, but he wrote, you know, the, 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 one of the messages in social enterprise about managing teams or creating businesses is about, you know, we've been talking for about 20, 20 years about our business model of happiness. And, you know, so that's why I went to him because the, the Dalai Lama, I'm not a Buddhist, but I went to the Dalai Lama, I got an audience with him to get his views on happiness because he, he made a sweeping statement that, that he said that our only purpose in life is to achieve happiness. I think that's the most craziest 
statement ever. He said that, and he, he believes that our only purpose in life is to achieve happiness. And when we believe that our happiness is connected to creating happiness for others, that's when you, know, you find your purpose in life. Um, so we've done this business model of happiness that we call, and we talk about it all the time at G Adventures, because every uh, program that we create, um, everything that we do is linked around human happiness. And there's four basic things that create human happiness. So if you go anywhere around the world and ask people what, what makes you happy, they'll say getting a new shirt or getting a new car, maybe walking their dog, spending time with their family, but it's usually about getting a new pair of shoes. And, it, and you know, that's why we consume so much, because we're trying to string together moments of happiness. But ultimately, um, to, for sustained happiness, it's a science. So, so I didn't make this up. There's thousands of studies on happiness and what drives human happiness. And they're directly related to businesses and industries. Um, and so if you can create an environment where people can achieve happiness, it's just a great way to get performance out of a group of people, any group of people, whether you're leading a group or whether you have your own company. And there's four main pillars to driving human happiness. Um, but you know what, but because we consume so much, we're, we're linking together all these moments of happiness to feel happy. And we actually need miserable people or else the world would collapse. The economy would collapse, so don't all get happy because the economy would collapse. But anyways, so, there's four main pillars to human happiness. One, the first one is the ability to grow. We have to be able to grow. Now, you'll give me that. In, order, in any business, if you work hard and you perform, you get a raise, you get a promotion. So you have to be able to grow and you have to be recognized for being able to grow. So that's a, a basic tenet of businesses, leading teams, or whatever it is that you're doing. The second one would be um, being connected. Being connected. How many people here who've, who've worked for someone uh, they couldn't stand? There's a few of you telling the truth, and the rest of you are liars, all of you. But, you know, we can achieve happiness. Um, I mean, we, you, if, we, if we're at a place where we, do, we don't um, like the people we're working with, we can do a great job, but we'll never achieve happiness. You can do a great job still in an environment where you're isolated. But I'm a big believer that the way social media and Facebook is so popular is because people want connectedness. They want to be connected to other people. I don't, I'm not on Facebook, but I find it very odd that people want to be connected to everyone they ever met in their entire life um, to stalk them, I guess. Um, like, and so you know, Facebook is this collection of creating your community and your connection. So you have the, the guy who sat behind you in math class, you'll be able to follow him for the rest of his life, I guess. Uh, but that's connectedness, that it's, and it's, so people are trying to achieve happiness with that kind of connectedness. Uh, the other one is being part, of, being part of something greater than yourself. That no matter what it is that you do in your business, whatever, whatever part of the business is, you're part of something greater than yourself. Uh, whether you're an executive or whether you work at, you know, in reception. Everybody feels they're part of something greater. Um, and the last one is freedom. That we have to be able to make mistakes. We have to be able to be ourselves. We have to be able to be unique and, and celebrate diversity. And all of these things that, give, that we take for granted every day, it's something called freedom. And that is the last, and all of those things, if you create them in, a, in any environment or any team you're managing, you're going to create happiness. And there's no better team that performs better than people that are happy uh, at what they do. And so everything that we do at G Adventures is created around one of those pillars, whether it's new programs, new different things. We do connection camps. We do all kinds of different programs or training camps or whatever we do. It's all connected, and it's all linked to one of these pillars of happiness. Um, but for us, creating, um, just creating um, the, the purpose in the, within our business and creating purpose in what we do, you know, we do... Um, uh, quite a few things. With our G for Good, the thing that we launched this year was called the Ripple Score. The Ripple Score took us five years, and an external STI, which is the Sustainable Travel International, built um, a, a way for us to gauge all the money that we spend locally when you book one of our trips. So we ask all of our suppliers, which we have tens of thousands of different suppliers and hotels and transport, and, and we find out what money goes to local people and local communities. Uh, what's locally owned, locally owned hotels, and we needed this to regulate our own buying practices. So the Ripple Score uh, was uh, just launched, I think, just about a month ago, but it's, it's been in the works for us for ages. It looks like this at the bottom of the pitch. And the money that we use to run the tour, um, it'll give you a percentage in the corner of how much is actually used and spent on the ground um, with that, with, in the community, and all the facilities and everything that we use along the way are locally owned, um, and, we've ch and we've checked, and, and this is changing our buying patterns as well. 
with operators that we work with, we want them only to hire local people, and we get percentages of how many people they have locally, making sure their leadership is all local, making sure the hotels are locally owned, it's not foreign owned, and creating that. And that's our, kind of our first way that we um, do our buying and create our programs. Um, the next one is through our responsible travel policies. Uh, earlier last month as well, actually, we released the last installment of a three-year, three-part um, uh, responsible travel policies. The first one was here, actually, with Jane Goodall, where we did our animal welfare policy, which was about two years ago. So with Jane Goodall uh, Institute here, uh, we did our travel, uh, our animal welfare policy. Um, that was a huge success and, is a and became an industry standard and you know, used by many different companies. And anyone who has a travel company here, you're welcome to use the same standards. They're made and we paid for you know, external people. We didn't write these, we used external groups, uh, different groups for each um, um, to make them industry standards. I've talked to CEOs of cruise companies who've looked at our animal welfare policies. Um, after that one, we created our responsible travel for indigenous people and doing indigenous tourism. And what are the rules of engagement with doing indigenous tourism? Uh, and then the last one we just released was child welfare guidelines. So we have these guidelines that we you know, put up with all of our wraparound, all of everything that we do, and we've made them as industry standards. They're not specific to us. Um, we, each one of them, if you ever go online, or I think there might be books there, is there a voice there with all the policies? Which will show you some of the partners we use, uh, some of the organizations that we use uh, to come up with these. And they, they, it was over a period of many years. Um, the, last, the, the, the next one is the G-Values Fund. The G-Values Fund was actually um, the money that I made from Looptail. So Looptail was a huge success as a book. It was on New York Times bestseller list and did way better than I ever thought. I thought I was writing a book for just a few friends and maybe some people at my office, but it went all over the world. Um, and we, I made, and instead of taking that money out of, out of the bank, because I was gonna pay ridiculous tax, because in Canada we have ridiculous tax, I started the G-Values Fund, and G-Values Fund was people at the end of their career with us as a, as a tour leader, as CEOs on the ground, they could apply and stay with the company long term by creating a business for themselves. So the G-Values Fund has businesses around the world. This is one of our most, our most successful businesses, which three of our CEOs on the ground, Lap, Zoom Zoom, and Fong, created Hanoi Food Culture, which has just opened its second location and employs about 60, I think 60 or 70 people now in Vietnam. And they were just past tour leaders through our G-Values Fund, which is also, also um, you know, putting a responsible and sustainable, you know, um, to all of our, well, uh, controlling actually our environment with people who actually have been trained in our brand for many years and delivering on all of the services while creating local jobs for people. And the last one is what, as the examples I want to show you is around Planetera. So the Planetera Foundation. So I've got just, I've just got enough time to just show you some live examples. So my worst fear is talking to people, an audience, an esteemed audience like yourselves, to talk about all these great things about um, social enterprise, happiness business models, uh, transcending travel. These are all big, big uh, ways, you know, things that we talk about. And we talk about passion and purpose and happiness. I want to give you, I'm going to show you three very, very short examples of why, why we do things. So it's my worst fear that I talk about it, and then you guys don't see live examples. I'm going to show you three very short videos, but I'm going to explain each one of them to give you an example in the field on how we do things at G Adventures. Um, the first one I'm going to show is Oodles of Noodles uh, in Hanoi, Vietnam. Uh, sorry, Hoi An, Vietnam. Um, Oodles of Noodles is a program that we started with street kids, um, that are with Streets International. These are kids on the street to repurpose their lives. It's an 18-month training program where we have 100% employment on the other end for people, the kids getting jobs in uh, local, in the food and beverage industry and the tourist uh, hospitality industry when they get out. But in the meantime, in that program, they get off the street, they learn English in their training period, and they work in our cooking school. And all of our groups come through and um, work, go, go visit the community, go shopping in one of the markets with the kids, and come back and do a cooking school and create an amazing experience for our customers. Um, let me give you an example. This is how we kind of look at how we put experiences for customers while creating social change uh, with what we do. Let's take a quick look at Oodles of Noodles. This is Long Island. This is Hoi An, a picturesque Vietnamese port city. And these are Lon's noodles. These noodles right here will feed many hungry travelers. But more than that, it also feeds Lon's future. Hoi An attracts travelers from all over the world. And while its streets are undeniably pretty to stroll, they're also unfortunately the closest thing to home for many kids. Approximately 20,000 Vietnamese children are homeless and lack access to education, healthcare, and social protection. To help, 
G Adventures partnered with Streets International, a vocational program that helps street youth. Together, they develop the Oodles of Noodles Youth Tour Project. The project helps at-risk youth develop the skills they need to work in Vietnam's growing hospitality industry. So welcome everyone to the Oodles of Noodles cooking class today. While students learn the ins and outs of working in a busy kitchen, they get the opportunity to meet with G-Adventures travelers and practice their English. Donations to the project are invested into safe housing, tuition, medical insurance, and school supplies. A lot goes into making a pot of noodles, and what comes out is more than a meal. It's a future. I believe that with hard work, passion, happiness, we can do anything. So that's an example about uh, customer experience and creating an experience for customers on our trips. Um, I want to give you a, a very quick example here of uh, education. So anyone uh, believes uh, there's an a small island called Key Cocker. Has anyone been to Key Cocker? There's no cars, sand roads. Uh, we found out in this uh, town, in, in, on this island, that 35 percent of the children were enrolled in school. Uh, and, other, and after further investigation, we realized that a lot of these kids are actually serving our customers that are coming on the island and other tourists because the island has become popular with tourists. So we created the Bikes with Purpose program where we supplied bikes and worked with a, lo a local school for the first time. And, uh, and we branded them purple. It's all our brand experience. And we gave them a training course in which they could, um, if they go to school and register for school, they would get a job to do bike tours around the island with our customers and created Bike with Purpose. And in a very short period of time, it was uh, less than 18 months, we, there was 90% enrollment of the kids on the island into school. So it was a huge success on how tourism can have that positive impact on education. Let's take a quick look at Bikes with Purpose. This is Matthew. This is Keiko, a small island in Belize. And this is Matthew's bike. It may look like any other bike, but don't be fooled. This bike is an opportunity machine. Key Corker attracts travellers from all over the world, but as nice as it is to visit, it can be a difficult place to live, especially for young people. Beyond age 12, kids traditionally had to leave the island for school. Most would leave school altogether, with little chance of finding jobs. To help, G Adventures teamed up with Ocean Academy, the island's first high school, established to enable young girls and boys to stay in school near home. G Adventures kick-started Bike With Purpose by purchasing new bicycles, so Key Corker's young people can lead cycling tours around the island. G Adventures travellers get an insider's perspective on island life, culture and nature from someone who knows it best. Youth get to develop practical skills in tourism, communication and self-confidence. Some of Matthew's friends use the money they earn to help their families or to pay for college. You can go pretty far on a bike and with a little push, there's no telling where you'll end up. We look forward to having you visit Kick Offer on a Bikes of Purpose tour. And so that's an example of um, an education as well as a customer experience for us. And, and the last one is, uh, is our customer service. So people often, probably the most challenging where people say, how do you create social enterprise within our customer service? In 2015, for our 25th anniversary, we launched uh, this program, which is called Women on Wheels. Uh, Women on Wheels is in India. And these, the women that, we, that, uh, that apply for Women on Wheels are in shelters, uh, and women in the slums of India, single mothers. And we give them the opportunity to learn English and learn about women's rights in an 18-month training program. At the end of the program, they get a car. Uh, we give them a car, and they do all of our arrival transfers when you come into India. This has been a hugely successful program, taking a really mundane service like arrival transfers and created it into a social enterprise. Uh, we're about to launch Women on Wheels as well. Uh, we're looking into it in, in, um, in Nairobi and Johannesburg as well, South Africa, uh, because it's been such a huge success, creating, again, a regular service like just arrival transfers, uh, creating purpose around it, in, and a social enterprise um, helping these women out. So just take a quick look at Women on Wheels, my last example. When I go to wake up in the morning, I would see the faces of my beautiful daughters. I had no identity and also had little income. I knew I wanted a change for me and for them. There were many fears. What would people think of me? Was it safe? But I knew this was a great opportunity. 
When they came into Azad Foundation, the way they talked, they hardly talked some of them, the way they looked, the way they thought about themselves has changed completely. Two women who are now so confident, so sure of how they've been able to help their families. Women on Wheels is a social enterprise that provides livelihoods as professional chauffeurs to resource poor women and on the other hand also provides safe and alternate transport options to women users of the services. I learned to drive, I learned self-confidence and English, I learned about women's rights. G Adventures believes in responsible tourism. They have a lot of women clients who come into India to travel. They were looking for safe transport options for the women who come into India. They have supported us in terms of bandwidth, in terms of fleet size and the work that we are doing so that we can become a stronger organization. Now I work full time for Women on Wheels. I enjoy talking with the travelers. They feel safe with me. I know I have courage and confidence in myself. I hope women everywhere pursue happiness and freedom. Now when I see the faces of my daughters, I know everything is going to be fine. So that's an example of uh, for us for customer service. So my time is running out here. Um, so I just wanted to leave you with one more thought. So in 2015, the World Bank did an extraordinary speech where they said that we were going to be able to um, see the end of extreme poverty in our lifetimes. By the year 2030, we could eliminate, el el eradicate extreme poverty on the planet, which is, a, which is an extraordinary uh, idea. So the, and, and they said that um, it's like the, 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 the numbers they were giving that back in 1990, when this is when we started G Adventures, uh, way back then, there was 5.2 billion people on the planet, um, um, and two billion of those people lived in extreme poverty. So that's the idea. This is where we were in 1990. Uh, today, in, in 2018, we have 7.3 billion people living on the planet, but only 1 billion people living in extreme poverty on the planet. Um, so if you, if you look at it, in the 28 years that, since, since um, we started, um, but 28 years since um, 1990 when we started this, this, this talk to, to begin with, um, there has been, uh, a population has grown by 40%, from 5.2 to 7.3, but the number of people living in extreme poverty has, has dropped dramatically from 36 to 12%. So this is an extraordinary, extraordinary thing that, that's happening. And, you know, when you, they asked me to, to, today to speak about, you know, finding more passion, purpose, and happiness. There's no greater way to find purpose in our industry than being part of that solution. Because the thing that we have is we have passionate people we have the most passionate people that are, you know, that got into this industry because they love what they do, and they're passionate about what they do. They love talking about where they work, um, and we outpace every other industry around us. And we have people going to the 40 poorest countries in the world, spending thousands of dollars on holidays. If done right, we're missing a great opportunity to transform lives and change the world, and, tra and, and for tourism to be a vehicle for that. And there's no greater way to find purpose right now than to be in, the, that in, in this industry and being part of that movement. So thank you very much for your time. Enjoy the rest of WTM.